Hey everyone, welcome to my theater space. Today we're going to take a look at a brand new sub from SVS. And maybe take a look isn't the right way to say it, since as you may know, I'm not a fan of looking at my equipment. I like watching movies without seeing the gear, which is why when SVS reached out about testing their new 3000 in-wall subwoofer system, I was intrigued and I jumped at the opportunity. I've got it installed in my screen wall back here and I've been enjoying it for a couple weeks now. How did it perform? Stick around. The SVS 3000 in-wall subwoofer system is a dual 9-inch sealed subwoofer box that installs in any standard 2x4 framing and it's powered by an 800 watt with a 2500 watt peak sledge rack mount amplifier. With its in-wall design, the 3000 is very versatile for those with limited floor space or who don't want to have big boxes in their room. It literally disappears into any room, any situation but its performance makes it a solid choice even if you aren't limited by your installation options. I have it installed back here as a single cabinet configuration, but it's also available as a dual cabinet configuration with the single rack mount amp. But there are a couple quick notes on that configuration. Powering two cabinets will cut the amp's power in half from 800 to 400 watts and you can't decide later that you want to add a second cabinet if you ordered a single. You need to order the dual configuration from the get-go. The drivers and amp operated a different impedance in a dual configuration and that needs to be set at the factory. The 3000 in-wall has two active 9-inch high excursion drivers and an aluminum baffle. The enclosure is hefty and solid as you'd expect from SVS. Installation in my situation didn't take long at all since I have an open frame screen wall and there's no drywall to deal with. I opted to skip the pre-construction kit that SVS supplied and I mounted the frame of the sub directly to my exposed studs. Note, if you're planning a similar installation, you'll need to secure the dog leg screws that would normally secure the sub to drywall or the pre-construction kit to avoid having them rattle with the sub. I wrapped some packing foam I had on hand behind them and then tightened them down and this eliminated any rattling that I had been hearing. The amp is essentially the same amp as the rest of the 3000 series but in a rack mount form factor. It has DSP controls to fine tune performance. It was really easy to connect to the SVS app for advanced settings and everything you need to mount it in your rack is included. The 3000 in-wall is primarily sold through authorized SVS dealers in order to ensure proper installation, but if you're handy and want to install it yourself, you can buy it directly from Crutchfield. Before semi-permanently installing the sub cabinet, I connected everything and turned on the 3000 in-wall and I turned off my trusty existing SVS PB2000. I turned off my Anthem Processor's Arc Genesis room correction software and I took some REW measurements from different locations. I was really curious about the flexibility of installing it in my screen wall, both in terms of the left and right options, but also the option of raising it up between the LCR speakers behind the screen. I actually sat down with Ed Mullen from SVS and Chris Seymour from Seymour Screen Excellence who made my screen to discuss the pros and cons and options and limitations before I tested it. You can take a look at that conversation right up here. I wanted to test some of these possible installation locations before I mounted it. So I tested it in the lower right corner below the right channel speaker the lower left corner be below the left channel, which is closest location to my existing sub, as well as I elevated it between the center and right channel and at the floor level in that same stud bay. And while each of these showed slight differences in the measurements, they were all really similar. They all showed a huge null right around 42 hertz in my room. My PB2000 shows the exact same null, so it's not a result of the in-wall sub cabinet or the performance at all. It's definitely the room. 
I would show you how all those locations measured comparatively, but like an idiot, I accidentally overwrote those measurements after I installed the sub. So take my word for it. They looked you know, a lot like this and they were all really similar. Because they were so similar, I chose to mount it in the lower right hand corner of the room because it did show slightly better low end extension right where the sub began to roll off around 27 hertz. And because I didn't want to have to alter my false wall to prevent the sub affecting the screen if I had put it directly behind the screen material. Once installed, I reran Arc Genesis, measured with REW, and started going through the, the usual suspect demo clips on my Kaleidoscape. I'm not gonna lie, it took me a little bit to really reset my mind and my ears. The first couple hours of listening with the in-wall, I couldn't stop comparing it to the sound of my ported in-room sub, which is just not a fair comparison. The 3000 in-wall is not meant to compete head-to-head -head with something like a PB2000. So after a couple hours, my partner came downstairs and we started watching Beef on Netflix and about three minutes into it, my ears perked up and I heard the 3000 for what it is and what it can do and not for what my other sub can do, not comparing it anymore. Listening to that somewhat slimmed down bass track from streaming content versus uncompressed or lossless on Kaleidoscape really cleaned up the signal that was reaching the in wall and it started to shine. It was room filling, clean, punchy and precise. And by the time we were a few episodes in, I was really <laughs> enjoying the sub and I knew exactly what I needed to do. The next morning I came back down here and I made some adjustments to the house curve in my Anthem processor so I could fit it in with the in-walls design output, focusing less on what my ported sub could do. I adjusted the high pass slope to roll off, corresponding more closely with the in-wall sub's capability, and I tweaked the minimum frequency correction as well. Once I stopped trying to make it sound like the PB2K and let it sound like a 3000 in-wall, I really noticed how hard it can hit. Honestly, I've had my PB2000 for almost 10 years now. To say I've grown accustomed to its sound is an understatement, but hearing the 3000 in wall sound so clean and so punchy and precise really kind of recalibrated my ears and it recalibrated how I was listening to this sub. And it also recalibrated my thoughts about what I actually want out of subs in my room. With all the recalibration going on, I decided to really recalibrate, and I dug back into the archives for some content that I hadn't been demoing repeatedly for months on end. I wanted to eliminate expectations. I pulled up Kong Skull Island, Rise of Skywalker, Promising Young Woman, and Whiplash. Titles I've demoed on many systems, many scenes over the years, but I haven't really viewed any of them recently. Popping through some of my favorite scenes on these films, the 3000 in-wall was really impressive. Clean, tight, and punchy. One word kept popping up in my notes. Fun. While it definitely did not have the output in the low 20s that my ported sub has, I never felt like it was thin or unenjoyable. The in-wall has enough low-end extension to satisfy most listeners. It is able to vibrate the couch in here, despite the fact that we have concrete flooring. I never found myself wanting to turn the sub volume up. It has plenty of output, and this isn't necessarily a small room. The extension drops off below 27 hertz, but above that there is no shortage of output. Another really impressive aspect of the sub is how easily and cleanly it blends with my next level acoustic bed layer speakers. It's really seamless at the crossover point. Listening to Whiplash got me in the mood for more music. Such an accurate sub screams out for music. So I started with Rocket Man and Bohemian Rhapsody, which both sounded amazing. And that brought me into Muse's Simulation Theory concert film on Kaleidoscape. It has a brutal bass track and we had just seen them live. Once again, while low-end extension was not as deep as a ported sub, my tastes lean more towards fast and accurate 
and the in-wall wins out here. Next up, I switched over to the Apple TV to listen to some Atmos music tracks. There are some fantastic sounding mixes out there right now, like Odessa's latest, the new Dark Side of the Moon remix, and even Kiss's Destroyer. Really interesting mixes that add something. And again, the SVS in-wall excelled here with accuracy and complete absence of boomy or one notey bass, which is critical for music listening. The SVS 3000 in-wall subwoofer system is not necessarily going to rattle the dishes in your cupboard upstairs, but it's not what it's designed to do. Instead, it's going to punch you in the chest over and over and over, and it will beautifully articulate each note of a film score or a concert. This sub punches beyond the typical in-wall arguments of, I don't want to see it, or I don't have the floor space. I think there are plenty of instances where this sub would be the perfect solution. If your primary content source is streaming, then this could very well be all the sub you're ever going to need. The amount of low-end information your system needs to reproduce streaming audio is actually pretty well aligned with the output of the 3000 in-wall. If impact and accuracy are more important to you than having to bolt everything in your room down because of vibrations, if you listen to a lot of music, this is a perfect match. The fact that it can disappear, that's just a bonus. For me, the 3000 in-wall has been very impressive once I focused my expectations on what the sub was designed to do. In fact, I like the overall sound much more than my PB2000 ported in-room sub. The more I listen to this sub in my system, the more I grow accustomed to the sound of a sealed sub, the more enthralled I've become with it. And again, it's only a bonus for me because I have the space, but I love that it disappears into my front wall. So this is an interesting sub to recommend because I don't want to set those unrealistic expectations, but I do absolutely recommend it if it fits your situation. It's not unlike recommending a set of bookshelf speakers because they have great bass extension for bookshelf speakers. They're not going to sound like towers, but they're going to be great bookshelf speakers. The in-wall sub is not going to give you the same low-end response as a PB3000, and you shouldn't expect it to. What it is going to give you is a fantastic option for a punchy, fast sub, whether you want to hide it or not. If your content sources are primarily streaming or broadcast, I don't think you can go wrong with one or better yet, two of these. And that's my review of the SPS 3000 in-wall subwoofer system. I've really enjoyed my time with this and I'm really glad I was able to hear it in my room and actually compare it to what I've known for a decade now. And I think it's convinced me to make the move to sealed subs actually. Which do you prefer, sealed or ported subs and why? Let us know in the comments below and please like and subscribe while you're there. Thanks for tuning in today and I'll see you again real soon on another real world review.